the economy of cooperation with the operation of God, the economy of universal providence, and his seventh dispensation was a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ. Well, that part he got right. <laughs> that is a dispensation, the literal 1,000-year reign of Christ. There was a guy by the name of Isaac Watts who lived from 1674 to 1748. I'm not going to list you all his dispensations. I'm trying to make a point though. This isn't new teaching. This isn't new teaching. So <clears throat> the truth is that a lot of the works on dispensational truth, although the people that I think tried to do them probably had a, a, an idea that was noble, they wanted to identify what the dispensations were, most of them are wrong. Most of them either add dispensations that don't exist or they take away dispensations that do exist. And you say, well, preacher, you're always saying everybody's wrong and that you've got the right answers, and I don't have the right answers. You know what has the right answers? This. Your dispensations have to line up with this. And if somebody identifies a dispensation and I can show from this that it's not a dispensation, then that's wrong. Amen. If somebody admits a dispensation that I can show from this does exist, then their thesis is wrong. So there's two folks that actually did a pretty good job. You probably heard of them, at least one of them. Um, uh, C.I. Schofield, Do you know, have you ever heard of him? You ever heard of the Schofield Reference Bible? You know, the first edition was pretty good, the one that was by him, but when he died in his committee took over and made all kinds of changes. The, the, the new Schofield is not worth the papers written on. At least his notes aren't. Amen? But he, had, he, he identified some, some dispensational truth, and he was pretty good, pretty close. And, uh, but there's another guy that I talk about. His name is Clarence Larkin. And in his humble uh, approach, he wrote a book that he entitled The World's Greatest Work on Dispensational Truth. He also wrote a book, The Humblest Man and How I Achieved It. <laughs> okay, he didn't write the second book. But, you know, to name your book The World's Greatest Book, but you want to know what? It is The World's Greatest Book on Dispensational Truth. He didn't miss the mark. And you can go through, and he gives you Bible references. He draws these charts that are phenomenal. He was an engineer by trade. He wasn't a preacher. And being an engineer, he is an artist. And he drew these different charts that would identify the, the dispensations, and he'd give Bible verses to back it up. And it is, in my opinion, the world's greatest work on dispensational truth. So I told you that dispensation doesn't mean a period of time. So what does the word dispensation mean? I'm going to tell you. It comes from a Greek word, oikomon, oik, if I can pronounce this Greek word, oikonomia, oikonomia. I used to be really good at Greek when I went through Bible school, but you don't use it and you lose it. It's just the truth. Uh, oikonomia, and it doesn't mean a period of time at all. What it means literally is, quote, the laws by which a household is operated or the way the master of a house arranges his household. That's what it means. Does that mean a period of time? Not even close. Not even close. So <clears throat> our word ecumenical actually comes from this Greek word. Now, the ecumen ecumenical movement is not a good movement at all. Churches shouldn't be coming together. There's churches I won't join with in any kind of, you know, if, if, uh, if the Catholic Church contacted me and said, uh, Pastor Day, we're having this get-together where we're going to have a sing-along, and we're just wondering if your church would want to come. My answer would be, mm, no, we don't believe the same way. How can two walk together except they be agreed? Don't be unequally yoked. And uh, so, if God is the master of the house, and when it comes to the Bible in this world, God is the master of the house, then the biblical dispensation will be the laws by which God operates, or the way God arranges his 
household. That's a biblical def uh, definition of a dispensation. And God can do whatever he wants to do. The preacher that says, listen, everybody gets saved the same way. The Old Testament looked forward to the cross and the New Testament looks backward to the cross. That's so much bunk. Did you know in the Old Testament, crucifixion didn't even exist. Those guys couldn't look forward to the cross. Crucifixion only existed about 100 years before Jesus Christ was crucified. They couldn't look forward to a cross. They didn't know what a cross was. Okay, well, it wasn't a cross. It was Jesus. Oh, really? They rejected Jesus. If they were looking forward to him, don't you think when he showed up, they'd say, oh, finally, you're here. We've been waiting for you. We were looking forward to you. They missed it. They weren't looking forward to that. They weren't looking forward to it. How'd they get saved? Doing what God told them to do. Doing what the master of the household established as rules for that household. That's how they got saved. And we're going to look at some of those. But since about the 1700s, it's been about since the 1700s, that men have defined a dispensation as a period of time. And I see where they get that. I, I'm not really faulting them. I see where they get that idea. Because you can go back historically and you can define dispensations by specific periods of time. The time between Moses and John the Baptist was a very specific period of time, amen? The time between Adam and Moses was a very specific period of time, amen? And that's where they kind of, listen, it just happened through laziness. Because I can go back and, and, and identify previous dispensations as a period of time, therefore a dispensation is a period of time. No, because guess what? You can't define the church age with a period of time. Because it isn't over yet. But it's still a dispensation. Hmm. Well, time is irrelevant to God. Time is a man-made thing. God doesn't even have time. He's at the beginning and at the end at the same time. To him, all things are happening simultaneously. Historically, knowledge of dispensation has been misused and abused. That's why some people turned away from dispensations, because... Uh, it's, it's been used to do away with personal work. How many of you enjoy personal work? You know, where you go out and talk to a complete stranger about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not easy to do. When I went to Bible school, we were required to go out street preaching. You say, what's that, preacher? Well, you go out to a busy road in a metropolitan area, and you get on a corner where there's all kinds of people walking, and you throw your Bible up in the air and you go, the Bible says! And you start preaching. And your flesh wants to crawl away from it just like anybody that's there helping you. They want to crawl away from it too. And all those sinners that aren't saved, they want to crawl away from it. And people that are saved that have never seen it before, they want to condemn you because you're not representing Christ very well out there yelling at folks. But you're not really yelling at them. You're just speaking loud enough that people can hear you from across the street. So it's been used to do away with personal work. Dispensations have been used to override the convictions of the Holy Spirit. Dispensations have been used to ignore calls to the mission field or supporting of missions out in the mission field. It's been used by preachers to quit preaching on sin. Dispensations have been abused. And so instead of preaching truth about dispensations, the pastors over the course of time just quit talking about it. There was a group called the Burians. How, who have you, how, has anybody heard of the Burians? Burians. Bereans. Bereans. Have you heard of them? There was a group, and they're a group that misused dispensations. 
or a group that did, but they got their name from Acts chapter 17, verse 10 and 11, where it talks about from Bure or what I, I, I'm not good at Berea. Berea, where they were from Berea. And they took the position that they searched the scriptures more thoroughly than other Christians in the body of Christ. That's what the, how you say it again, the Bure, Bereans, that's what the Bereans do. And because of their belief system, they lack some qualities. Some of the things I already talked about. They weren't really big on personal work. They weren't really big on supporting missions. They weren't really big. They weren't soul winners. They weren't evangelistic. Uh, they, never, they were never persecuted for their stand on Christ. You know, if you've never had anybody chew you out or give you grief over your stand on Christ, you need to work on your testimony, brother and sister. The Bible says that we will have persecution. I, I got mine early on from my family. When somebody says, when I tell somebody, are you going to heaven? Oh, yes, I'm a, I'm a Lutheran. <laughs> okay, well, are you saved? I didn't ask if you were a Lutheran. I asked if you're saved. Jim tells that story about the guy that when he got into the meeting with a pre message, he went back and the guy announced to him, I'm a Catholic, and Jim's response was, are you a saved Catholic or a lost Catholic? That's a great question. <laughs> are you a saved Lutheran or a lost Lutheran? Are you a saved Mormon or a lost Mormon? Because that doesn't have to do with religion, it has to do with relationship. Recognizing that Jesus is God. So anybody who actually reads his Bible and studies his Bible would have to acknowledge dispensations. You say, well, that's kind of a bold statement. Well, look at Ephesians chapter 3. You say, preacher, this is the third message, and you haven't really started getting into dispensations yet. I'm laying a foundation. And if it takes 40 messages to lay the foundation, I'm going to lay the foundation. Amen? You can't build a house without a foundation. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2, the apostle Paul says, if you have heard of the dispensation, wow, Paul recognized dispensations. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you word. The dispensation of the grace of God was given to Paul. And Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. God didn't give that. To, you know, I, let's go back to my teaching last week. I said, there weren't any Christians until after Acts 11. Paul didn't get saved till Acts chapter 9. The gospel of salvation was given to Paul to give to the world. Well, if he wasn't even saved till Acts chapter 9, then nobody else got saved up until after that. Amen? So the question was asked last week, and it's a good question. I'm not criticizing. Listen, I always welcome questions. The question was asked last week. So if somebody died, if one of these people in Acts chapter 2 died that were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, what would happen to them then? Well, it's a hypothetical question. It's hard to answer hypothetical questions. But I'm going to tell you this. Between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 11 was a matter of weeks. Probably none of them died yet. And I believe that all the folks in Acts chapter 2 that got baptized in the name of Jesus Christ at some point came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and they did get saved. Because if you go to the bottom of Acts chapter 2, it says, And the Lord added unto the church such as should be, not such as were saved, such as should be saved. Hmm. Well, if they should be saved, I imagine at the point when the... When the uh, when the revelation was clear, they did get saved. That would be my answer. Well, are you right? Who knows? It's, it's, a, it's a hypothetical question with a hypothetical answer. That's between God and God can do whatever God wants to do. Amen? Mm -hmm. So uh, Ephesians chapter 2, Paul talks about the dispensation of grace of God. And he said it was given to him. It wasn't given to Peter. It wasn't given to... Thaddeus, it wasn't given to any of the other apostles, certainly wasn't given to Judas Iscariot, <laughs> it was given to Paul. And Paul didn't get saved until Acts chapter 9. You say, well, 
then what about that Ethiopian eunuch that John brought up last week? Sure sounds like salvation in Acts chapter 8 to me. It sounds like he got baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that he got baptized the same way in Acts 2.38, John the Baptist baptism. So based on Ephesians 3.2, Paul identifies a specific dispensation that was given to him for us. And it defines what that dispensation was. It was the dispensation of the grace of God. So we know there's a dispensation of the grace of God, amen, because the Bible talks about it. And God gave the information to Paul who gave it to the world. And as I said, Paul's conversion takes place in Acts chapter 9, verses uh, 17 through about 20. So last week when I stated that there were no Christians until Acts eleven twenty six, I also gave some qualifications to that statement. Uh, sometimes you all miss the qualifications. You just hear what I say and run with it. I want you to listen to the qualifications. I could not say, here's the qualifications. I said that I could not say nobody was saved. That would be judging their heart, and I'm not given the right to judge their heart. And I made that clarification before I started talking about it. I also stated that they were in a transitional period between dispensations, which is a true statement. I also pointed out specific wording that traditionally has been interpreted as salvation and showed that it had no such application of salvation, such as should be saved, not such as were saved. Amen? And as we were going through this, there were some questions that were asked, which I've already talked about. And one was about the Ethiopian eunuch. And what happened to those people that were baptized at Pentecost? And I stand firm that I don't think anybody died between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 11. That was, uh, we, you think of it as being centuries, it was weeks. God was given his revelation continually, day by day, adding to it. Amen? So... going to bypass some of this stuff because it's redundant. So with everything that was said, I don't think any of them were saved because salvation had not been revealed that we understand as a church age. How can they be saved if it hasn't even been revealed? God through this transitional period may have saved them even though they didn't know exactly. So what I'm saying is this. God looks at our heart. And if them getting baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, if God says they've demonstrated with their heart, he may have saved them. <laughs> I can't say that he didn't. I can say that the true revelation about salvation has not been given. And I think that there's scripture that would back up the idea that these folks were not saved, but later on got saved. I think there's scripture that backs that up. Turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18 and verse 24. The Bible says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. I'm going to pause there for a minute because if you go back to all those verses prior to Acts chapter 11, it was John the Baptist's baptism that was given to them. Hmm. You say, how do you get that, preacher? Hold your finger here in Acts 18. We're not done. Turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. What did Acts 2.38 say? Be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. It was John the Baptist baptism that, John, that Peter talked about in Acts chapter 2. Amen. Look at uh, Luke chapter 3. John the Baptist saying, 
baptism did the remission of sin, or was he pointing to Jesus Christ? He was pointing to Jesus Christ. He was pointing to Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 3, verse 3. And he came into the country, John the Baptist, and he came into the country, all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That's John the Baptist's ministry. Baptism for remission of sins. Um, and so if we go to Acts 2.38, we see that same concept. Baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now turn back to Acts chapter 18. We just finished verse 25. Look at verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. What was he speaking about? The apostles' doctrine. What was the apostles' doctrine? Baptism, the baptism of John the Baptist. Verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the, in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took the, unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. So what happened? This guy was exposed, just like the Jews in Acts 2.38, to what is called the Apostles' Doctrine. And what was the Apostles' Doctrine? The baptism of John the Baptist. And that's what he understood. He was he was a man that understood that the Jews killed the Messiah and he's preaching the baptism of John. But by this point in Acts 18, God had already revealed to Paul the path to salvation. So Aquila and Priscilla took him off to the side and said, what you're doing is good, but you're missing the boat. Here's how you get saved. They, they told him the word more perfectly based on further revelation. I think all those Jews that went and got baptized in Acts 2.38 were exposed to the truth after it was revealed completely, and I think they all got saved. And those, those uh, people that were added daily to the church, such as should be saved, eventually did get saved. The Ethiopian eunuch was baptized in the name. That's the apostles' doctrine. It is the baptism of John. But I believe that Ethiopian eunuch's Later on, got the full uh, exposure to the true gospel that was revealed to Paul, and I believe he got saved. So I think all the folks that are identified prior to Acts 11 that made a profession did get saved, but I don't believe they got saved prior to Acts 11 because God had not revealed salvation yet. The kingdom of God, the uh, kingdom of heaven, I keep saying kingdom of God, and there's a difference between the two. The kingdom of heaven was being offered to the Jews. You'll see Paul in frustration say, I tried to come to you Jews and you reject the message, so I'm going to turn to the Gentiles. And Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. Amen? Have I lost anybody yet? Okay, good. Baptism doesn't take away sins. We know that. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can take away your sins, but it hadn't been revealed yet. It was revealed to Paul. Look at Romans chapter 3. Say, preacher, we're going through a lot of Bible. Amen, isn't it good? Romans chapter uh, 3 Verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Is that what it says? Being justified freely by the, His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in baptism. Through faith in his blood. It's his blood that saves us, not baptism. Baptism doesn't save you. What does baptism do for you? Get you wet. Get you wet. <laughs> but it's the first step in discipleship. It doesn't do anything for you spiritually except it's a public profession in faith. You're saying, I was 
killed, buried, and rose again a new likeness. That's why the Bible says, reckon yourselves dead unto sin. You know, I've never seen a dead person that had a problem with sin. If you reckon yourself dead unto sin, dead people don't sin. They're already dead. Amen. You're supposed to kill that old man. I die daily, Paul said. Daily. Truth be told, we probably need to die hourly. <laughs> I know you guys can't tell by looking at me, but I have this issue where I like to eat food. <laughs> Sometimes I need to say no. Amen? Amen? Because gluttony is a sin. And I need to die to that stuff. By the way, I've lost 30-some pounds in the last couple months. Yay. And uh, pray to God that I continue to, to drop that weight. So... It's by the blood of Jesus Christ that we're saved, not by water baptism. So go back to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to look at it a little bit. 3 2. Going to look at it a little bit closer. It says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word. If we define a dispensation as a period of time, we have some problems here. Notice Paul said it was given to me. Was Paul given a period of time? No, he was given a concept. He was given a doctrine. Amen. He wasn't given a period of time. Uh, what period of time began with Paul? It didn't. It, rhetorical question. It didn't begin with Paul. It would have to be the grace of God and not a time period. We don't know how long this time period will be. Exactly. No man knows the day or the hour. We know it's going to be somewhere around 2,000 years. If we, if we think our current calendar is right, it's already been 2,020 years. But we know, at least the folks that are regular here, know that our calendar is not right. Could be off as much as 400 years. Hmm. It's a dispensation. It's the way that the Master, God, deals with His creation. His house. And God decided, if you trust my son and believe that he's me, isn't that weird? His son is him. But it's true. Mm -hmm. Philip said to Jesus, Jesus, show us the Father and it will suffice us. And Jesus responded to Philip and said, Philip, you've been for me so, so long and you don't get it. When you see me, you see the Father. Jesus is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're three entities. And you say, I, that's way too much for me to get. You're three entities. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. You say, well, they, they, people have seen Jesus, and it says in the Bible that nobody has seen God at any time and lived. And that's a true statement. You've never seen me, folks. You see my body, but I'm my soul and my spirit. You've never seen that. You've never seen me at any time. <laughs> You've seen my body that God has given me to house my soul and my spirit, but you haven't seen me because this body's going to turn to dust, but I'm still going to exist. Amen. Praise God, amen. amen. Judy, your joints won't hurt no more. Amen. And you'll be able to feel your feet, amen. amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We can further debunk the idea that dispensation is a period of time simply by comparing Scripture with Scripture. We've already looked at Ephesians 3, 2. Now let's see what Paul says in Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 25. Paul says, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Paul said in Ephesians that the dispensation was given to him was the dispensation of the grace of God. In Colossians, he simply calls it the dispensation of God. Words make mean something. 
Ain't that right, Monty? Monty tells me all the time when, he, when I say something that is kind of out of the whack, he says, Pastor, words mean something. You should pay attention to the words you use because words mean something. Amen, brother? Amen. Amen. And that's good, that's good advice. We should all heed that advice. Words do mean something. If Paul says grace of God in one thing and then just says of God in another thing, there's a difference. Amen. Um, when we look at historical dispensations, as I said, they can be bracketed with specific time periods we know about the exact time periods. We may not have it exact, but we know about the exact time periods. It must be noted that only reason that we can do that is because that dispensation has ended. Any dispensation that's still out in the future, and there are some that are still out in the future, we can't bracket them with time brackets. Now, some we can come close. We know that the thousand-year reign of Christ is how long? A thousand years. That's a no-brainer. We know the seven-year tribulation is seven years. seven years. Doesn't take a rocket scientist there. Not a good time. But when we go to the church age, we don't know. Could be that we're at 2020 already. Now, I said that there's been science that has shown that our calendar could be off by as much as 400 years. It can't be off for 400 years because of the prophecy of Israel becoming a nation. So we don't have 400 years to wait <laughs> till Christ comes back or till we get raptured. This Amen. Afternoon. That would work for me. That would work for me. Wouldn't it be uh, great if we got raptured right out of church? Amen. I mean, we don't even leave to go home. We're in the process of dismissing and God says... <laughs> Come up hither. Praise him here, praise him there. Praise him here, you know, and, and you know, one of the greetings, we're, we're going to wrap this up and, and you can stand for prayer, but uh, one of the things that I like to tell folks that I don't see very often that are brothers and sisters in Christ, I always leave them with here, there, or in the air. Amen. 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 So let's stand for prayer. If I don't see you again, I'll see you later. Amen. Lord, I pray that we'd take just a moment here of self-examination. Um, God, we our memory verse tells us that we can know that we have eternal life. We can know it. God, I pray that each person here would examine their heart. Is there a point in time, Lord, where they came to you confessing that you're God and asking for your salvation? You can't just always have been a Christian. You can't say, because I was raised in a Christian home, I'm a Christian. There has to be that point in time, Lord, where, you, where a person recognized that they were a sinner and that they were going to go to hell because of their sins. And they reached out to you confessing that you are God and asking for your salvation. Lord, I pray that everybody would examine. And if they fall short in identifying a specific time, they don't have to know the date or the exact time of day, but they should be able to think of the event when they called out to you saying, save me. If they can't, if they fall short and can't do that, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would convict them and that they would not leave here today without having that thing settled. Now listen, I want every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't want anybody looking around. I promise you, I will not embarrass you. I will not point you out. I will not yell out your name. But I'm going to ask a question because it helps me to pray. If you say, preacher, I'm thinking about it, and I can't think of a time like that, would you pray for me, preacher? Because I'd like to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. If you could just slip that hand up and tell me, preacher, pray for me, because I want to know, but I don't know for sure. Anybody like that? 
Just lift your hand up. Well, it appears we're all Christians here today, folks. I'm going to ask the reverse of that question, though. I'm going to say, if you can say for sure, preacher, there was a point in time I knew I was destined for hell, but I called upon the name of the Lord, and I got saved, and I know for sure I'm going to heaven when I die. If that fits you, raise your hand up high. 